everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the, one of our post-show chats with our wonderful humanities experts for the Yellow Wallpaper with Music Theater of Madison. I'm Lindsay Holnetz. I'm our outreach specialist for this show, and I'll let our other uh, guests introduce themselves. Megan, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, I'm Megan Randolph. I'm the executive director of Music Theater of Madison, and I also played the woman in the yellow wallpaper. And, and Robin? I'm Robin Woods. I am recently retired from the English department at Ripon College, and um, I am a great lover of both the theater and of Charlotte Perkins Gilman, with all her flaws. <laughs> <laughs> And Robin was my professor 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, that is exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Robin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're so excited that you were able to see the show and also uh, to chat with us a little bit about Charlotte Perkins Gilman and the yellow wallpaper and how it connects to theater. Um, so for our audiences, this is just gonna be a chance for them to learn a little bit more, um, extend their learning beyond what uh, they could get from our audience guide. Um, so first thing I wanna ask you, Robin, is so you are a retired literature professor and you are also an avid theater goer and performer yourself. Um, <laughs> um, she's a fantastic performer, um, nice. hilarious. Um, and uh, Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as someone who loves literature and loves theater, how did translating a story that you've, you've taught a lot, um, translating a story that you're very familiar with to the stage, how did that resonate with you as an audience member and as someone who knows this story so well? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a really good question because I tend to be persnickety about adaptations <laughs> and uh, I have great respect for the text. I, I think that, um, that actually, performing this. I, first of all, I thought it was a great adaptation. I missed the creeping, but um, I thought it was wonderful and that it really captured what her state of mind was in all of the different stages. And, and there were a couple of things that I thought were really important about it. And one, um, I, I saw the question that you sent, Megan, what is different about the performance? And, and this struck me early on, um, the song about time, which is just a wonderful song, um, that is not in the story. I mean, it's like she time is heavy on her, but it's not such a constituent part of it. And I was thinking this is because when we read it, we can't experience time with her. You know, we read the story in about half an hour. Um, we, you know, we can go back and we can extend it, but we don't experience time as she does. And that is exactly what performance does. It gives us that extra dimension. And I think that for the speaker, that is really important because, you know, she's stuck in this room for day after day and it's going to be, oh, a couple of months and then, you know, but she has to live through every hour of that and we just sort of skip through it and that's something that I think is really important about it and the other thing that struck me is that um, and this is partly because of the paper because of the way that the performance handled the paper you know she says early on in the story i wouldn't tell this to anybody i wouldn't say this to a living soul but this is dead paper so i'm okay saying it and you know, a lot of the problem is that she doesn't have anybody to communicate with. You know, she has to hide her writing from everybody. People are watching her and, um, and she can't speak, you know, she can't speak her mind. She can't have people around her that she's comfortable with. And 
So what she's looking for is an act of communication for somebody to hear her. And the, you know, the performance really closes that loop. You know, she's, you are speaking to real people. And so just in um, what Richard Bauman calls the performance arena, where, you know, which is the performance and the audience and, and all of that. And that was really, that arena was really important for Gilman too, for, um, because, because <laughs> she too had a theatrical bit. Um, and, and so it completes that, you know, the text is sort of crying out for a listener. And when you have the audience, you have that. And mm -hmm. that I thought was, yeah, and, and the night that I went to the audience, I thought, well, we were all in masks, but I thought, you know, everybody was really responsive. And it's like, oh, she has a listener at last. That's something <laughs> that that I thought was really important and, and something that I really enjoyed about the performance. Great. Um, Megan, is as the performer and as the show was being developed, that what Robin's saying about that, wanting to speak, to communicate, was that something in the rehearsal process that you talked about, um, the protagonist of our piece needing that connection and looking to the audience for that connection in the way that you performed it? Yes and no. I mean, we, I definitely break the fourth wall a bunch, mm -hmm. but it was more to me about picturing that woman in the wall. Um, mm -hmm. However, feeling the energy of the audience and feeling them listening certainly kind of heightened what I was doing and, and what I was, feeling and focused on throughout. So it was, a, I guess, a little bit of both. I think that the, the, the audience being there, that's just such a really important point, this finally getting to connect to someone. For me, it was also more about bringing the audience into what the experience would be like. And I think we've all We've all, you know, none of us had anything that extreme, but <laughs> we've all felt that need to get out and that feeling like the time is going on and on and on uh, recently. <laughs> so, um, and you mentioned the thing about the time and, and begging to speed the time along. And uh, I think that hopefully resonated with a lot of people. We had to figure out how to do that without letting it go too long right like so we had to give that that sense of urgency and needing to get out and how the time was dragging without actually dragging the musical right so that was that was a fine line yeah that was certainly a challenge we had to we had to figure out so well and as a solo performer you're beyond the dragging that time out you're you're performing by yourself and right. singing that whole thing yourself for over an hour so I think as you were thinking about the development too that that comes into play as well yeah like, the pacing how it all how it all goes because yeah it could it could have gone south and gotten boring very quickly <laughs> we hadn't really made sure that each moment was about something very specific so right definitely um, so Robin, I want to ask, so you, you're, you've spent a long time teaching the yellow wallpaper. I know I read it for the first time in one of your classes. Um, and <laughs> yes. I found, as I was going through my notes, I found, um, notes that I was taking in class and your name was on it. <laughs> oh, um, I actually, I think I probably went and got my notes before I wrote this play guide. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, Robin, is, so we know that the yellow wallpaper, you know, was written in the late, or in the early 1890s, and then kind of fell out of fashion, and then was really rediscovered in the 60s and 70s by um, feminist publishers, right? Mm -hmm. And so for you as someone studying literature and then becoming a professor, 
do, do you remember your first encounter with this story or how you in your early career decided to incorporate this story or what that kind of journey was that you can remember? If you can't, that's okay too. I totally do. Yeah, it's that's not a problem at all. I was in graduate school um, and it was oh, a really long time ago in the 80s. It was sometime in the 80s. And um, I was TAing for a friend of mine. They, um, you know, like a lot of places, they put graduate school students into the pipeline really early, which was good coming to Ripon. Um, and uh, so, so my friend was teaching and I was her TA. I did a little bit of teaching and a lot of the grading. And she taught that on the first day of the semester. That was the introduction to the class. And it was, um, well, you know, since I was new in the classroom for one thing, I was just like, wow, this is really a successful text to teach because I think I said this before, Everybody has an opinion. You can't not have an opinion about it. And it just dazzled me as a text and um, sort of the range of responses that people had to it. That's really wonderful. And then when I came to Ripon, which was in um, 1990, my second semester, I was asked by Michelle Whitler and Vance Kopkasten, um, who were teaching the Intro to Women's Studies class, to come in and do a lecture. And I thought, you know, the yellow wallpaper is a text that communicates so well. And so that was, um, that was actually the second time I taught it. And it was really, um, you know, it's a, it's a story that is beloved by educators and education because, um, you know, in any moment it is salient and its issues are crucial. Even as our discussion of those issues changes and progresses as it has, um, you know, it speaks to what is always sort of an issue in our world, you know, and, and I think that goes back to the question of communication. And it also speaks to um, the question of like, what is the role of the text? And um, you know, what does the story mean for its creator and for its, you know, the person who is captured in it? And, you know, what is, what is the role of a text in ways that we think about the world and the ways that we live our lives? And it just gets at the heart of so many things. And, you know, so it's something that I've sort of carried with me always and, you know, taught whenever I get a chance to. Um, so if, if we're thinking about the yellow wallpaper, or I would say literature in general, so we know um, through our research and our exploration that Charlotte Perkins Gilman, while this is really a kind of seminal piece of women's lit as we think about it in that context, right, that her views on race and her many of her social causes beyond the role of women's rights or things like that were from our modern context incredibly objectionable and mm -hmm. problematic right if if you look at the audience guide i talk a lot about that yeah. um so as readers as audience members um do you feel and, and megan i think that you can comment on this as well too excuse me <clears throat> Um, because I know that we've talked about that um, in choosing this piece, that that knowledge wasn't there. And then as we kind of did more examining, we were like, oh, okay. Um, but as, as, as readers, as audience members, as creators, um, do you feel like it's our obligation to think about pieces not only in our own lens but also through a historical context and to look at them um through both of those lenses and talk about what that might mean 
um, as we create or as we analyze pieces of literature that we're reading or things like that? Yeah, I, I do think that's important. Um, I think that's, I think that's critically important. And, you know, when, there are a few things I think that are interesting about this. Um, and I thought that you did a really nice job of contextual, contextualizing this um, within, you know, the, the different waves of feminist thought. And, and I thought that that was really useful. And, um, you know, at every stage, we just have sort of a partial, uh, oh, sorry. We have just sort of a partial knowledge of the writer and of the story. And when people started reading the story in the 70s, it was like, wow, look at this. We're learning so much about women and how, how they can be um, you know, locked away and disempowered and infantilized and, you know, and, and there are really important things about that medical treatments, views of mental illness, um, you know, it has a lot to tell us on that, but, um, you know, and that can be a really self-satisfied and satisfying narrative, you know, mm -hmm. oh, look at this, we know so much, you know, but, um, but there is, there is always more to discover and you can't ever just rest on your knowledge of any text. So I think in general, that's, that's one thing. I think another thing about um, Gilman in particular is that she wrote, um, as she said, with a purpose, for a purpose, and everything that she wrote was polemical. And when, um, when William Dean Howells published the story in his anthology, which was, I think, in, I don't know, 1913, something like that, she said, well, I just want you to know it isn't literature, you know, any more than the others that, you know, it's, it was just, it was written for a purpose. And, um, and so she engages politically. You know, it is a politically engaged text and she wrote it for that purpose. I think the yellow wallpaper of all of her work is the most per personal and the most powerful. Mm -hmm. But, you know, her intent was, you know, to point out these specific wrongs and to do something about them. And, you know, then there's this other story that she wrote, you know, why I wrote the yellow wallpaper and he responded. and. It may be true and it may not be true, um, but because she does that, because she engages politically, you know, she, I mean, we have to go there. She opens the door for that. And, and that's another reason I think that for Gilman, it really is important. And another thing I think is that, um, it, the women's movement in America, it has a really terrible history with race anyway. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who are like really important and like really important to me, um, they, they in, you know, in the later stages of, of their movement, they said and wrote terrible things and they were angry that black men were given the vote before white women. And it was a terrible divide and it's a shame, you know, to American feminist history. And I think we need to know that. And I think it's good to have any context where we can discuss that. Yeah. yeah. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. I was going to say, go ahead. Uh, absolutely. I think for us, it was like Lindsay said, we did not discover this information about Gilman until we were already rolling with this show. And we made the decision to name it and talk about it uh, and allow it to be an opening for questions. Of, of all kinds, as you said, um, what is the purpose of her story? Does the purpose, you know, she wrote it for the purpose of, of um, 
calling out this mental health person, uh, the, the doctor that had made everything so miserable for her. And she said, it's not literature and she engaged politically, but when it kind of takes on a purpose of its own that she didn't intend for it, what does that mean? And, and does that make the people who receive it, does that mean we don't get it? <laughs> you know, how does it change? through time and it, it as as a horror story as well you know that's kind of what we really tried to lean into a lot of is the is the scary aspect of it and the horror aspect and how it's sort of fallen into that genre but in regards to race i think it was an opportunity for us to think about um, making sure we check up on who our authors are uh, for starters, which I always will do from now on. Um, but also thinking about, of course, this term cancel culture, which has been redefined it to suit a million purposes. But in, in terms of like, do we cancel this story and do we put it away because of who the author was? Um, and I think that's something interesting that has pervaded a lot of our consciousness lately that somebody like JK Rowling, you know, do we, do we forget all about her because she's trash, uh, <laughs> or do we <laughs> appreciate, uh, what she left behind in a literary context? You know, it's, it's one thing when a person has done something that is on the page and that exists for more people to find. And throughout, as history progress, as as the future progresses, for people to understand differently and apply their own context to. Mm -hmm. So that was really what we had hoped that this would spark. And Lindsay did such a beautiful job of saying the feminist movement of the '60s and '70s, where Gilman was sort of revived. First of all, what she wrote had she wasn't trying to be. <laughs> anything other than and then then just hate this one doctor um and it wasn't intersectional feminism so it really doesn't count as feminine feminism as far as we're concerned today but at the time it inspired a lot of people to fight for women's rights so it's just it was a it was a complex decision and we just decided to use it as a a learning opportunity and, a, and an opportunity to provoke discussion and questions rather than answers, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think too, um, as, as we think about like, Megan, I think the, the example of J.K. Rowling is an interesting example, right? Because if we look at Gilman, Gilman is no longer alive. She, right. we are a, over a hundred years removed from when this piece was written. So we can't say to Charlotte Perkins Gilman, hey, so looking at the now context, would you maybe want to dial back on yeah. all these things you said about like how maybe we should put black people into essentially slavery again? Forced um, labor, yeah. Right? Because I mean, that piece that she wrote was like that, right? But if we think about cancel culture, right, and think about people who are alive, who do have the ability to apologize or <laughs> say, hey, I said this thing 15 years ago and I've learned, I've grown. I think that that's a really interesting thing for us um, as creators or even thinking about MTM, you know, in adapting this piece, right? We don't have the ability to say, hey, do you have you with time changed this context? I, I think that that idea of looking at things historically is important for us as creators and as readers and audience members as well, because we don't have the ability to talk to the creator, right? Yeah. Um, and so. it's a, so All we have is the text. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not a perfect comparison, I think, but I, that's maybe it does just show that automatically calling something off <laughs> regard you know it it it's very specific to the situations and, and specific to the time period um do we do we bury it 
um, because she's no longer alive and because we hate the things she said, or do we let it live on and, and let people let people experience it later? And it'll be that way with the Harry Potter books and, and JK Rowling's work. What will that mean 60, 70 years from now when she's long gone and kids are still reading her books? So yeah, with its with it on dead paper, <laughs> you know, what does that what does that mean? I just I think it's really interesting. And yeah, you're totally right. Like we can we can go to JK Rowling now and we can attack her on Twitter and be like, what is the matter with you? <laughs> um and she and can, she can double, down. double down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. what does that tell us? So yeah. You know, I have to, I don't, I don't like literary spec, well, I don't like speculation at all, but I have to believe Gilman would have doubled down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that like uh, you know, she certainly was very pronounced and decided in her views. And, you know, for one thing, I, you know, those views, you know, they're not explicitly manifest in the story, but they certainly inform it. You know, you like you're living in this normative world. And that's something I think the show does really well, you know, ordinary people, you know, that's you know, they're just they don't really belong in this mansion, but you know, they have, you know, I mean middle class privilege and you know, she's getting medical care and um, you know, and so it is written into the life they live, but it also engages that, you know, and yeah. it engages that in a real and thoughtful way, you know, what does it mean? And, you know, even the mansion where, you know, everything is empty and everything is locked up and everything, you know, there's problem with the co-heirs, you know, something has gone wrong with the patriarchy, with the transmission of property, you know, it's everything in that story is sort of politically laden and, you know, and that is, you know, we can see a little bit of how these issues play out and, um, you know, Maggie, I think that you're right in saying that it is situ situational because, you know, we don't, on one hand, we don't want to just promote instances of hate speech or, you know, give normativity to, you know, like, certainly Perkins' horrible views about the value of a baby. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, but it's part of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's part of the conversation in so many ways. It's been part of the conversation ever since it reappeared. Mm -hmm. And we have to care for that conversation too. And, you know, making sure that that everyone speaks, that, that, you know, that speech doesn't block out or cancel other speech. And there are a lot of voices in this story. And, you know, I think that that's one of the things that's really important that we not silence those voices. And Megan, I just wanted to say another thing about the performance. Um, well, I'm thinking about this you are everyone in the performance is you know that is a real triumph i thought of that show the way you embody all of the characters because you know you have to show us john and you have to show us jenny all those people have to be evoked but it's it's all on you to do that and i thought that was really wonderful to watch but anyway, so I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but, but yeah, I think it's, you know, voices, allowing voices, you know, and this continues to be an important voice. And I think that that's necessary. Yeah. I wish Janine could have been, Janine and Trinity could have been here today. Uh, Cause I know they have a lot to say about that. Um, but the, the thing with just sort of segueing into what you just said with, I feel like there have been a lot of adaptations about uh, where they do bring in Jenny and they do bring in John mm -hmm. and they bring in the other, the other people. And it really, I mean, I kind of conceived 
this, I had a couple rules. <laughs> I was just like, it's, it's, it's the woman and only the woman. And I don't want to see the wallpaper. Um, yeah, that was a really interesting decision. Why, why did you decide to do that? I think that it's as soon as we prescribe what the wallpaper looks like and prescribe what is scary, uh, there are some people who are going to go, a, they, well, A, just from a practical standpoint, they're going to be looking at the wallpaper to see if they can see the same <laughs> things I see. But there are also going to be some people who are like, I don't, that's not scary. <laughs> if you, the comparison I always make is to Stephen King uh, and how sometimes that adapts so beautifully to the screen, but most of the time it adapts very poorly <laughs> because yeah. when you're reading a scary book and you have to create the image of the thing that is terrifying, that's what makes it scary. You have to dig into your own brain and picture it. And so I just said, no wallpaper, we're going to we're going to let the audience build what they think the wallpaper is, uh, looks like. And I just also thought that adding, I've seen some adaptations and they put in the, a lot of times to make it longer, like the BBC did, I think an hour and a half film of yeah. this in 20 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. And it was the same thing. They put in Jen, uh, Jenny and they put in John and they put in some other people coming in and out of the house. And it just, she instantly becomes, there's no question that she's crazy. <laughs> there's, there's no, there's no, yeah, there's no question. If, if the audience watches, watches her and only her and experiences it with her, the audience gets to feel themselves going down the rabbit hole a little bit, I think. Um, so those were that's what I really wanted for this piece and that's what's really important is her subjectivity mm -hmm. that you know the feel yeah feeling that with her as you said you know she can't you know her husband is saying oh you, she shall be as sick as she pleases and you know very much not listening to her and mm -hmm. Um, and so you have to really get inside of her. And I can imagine, I haven't seen the BBC uh, production, but I've seen a few. And, you know, it's like, well, Jenny is not a monster. John right. is a monster. So, um, yeah, I think it just sort of Annie's up the hysteria. It's like, right. you know, there must be something wrong with her. These are perfectly nice people. And, you know, yeah. it's a nice house. Bad wallpaper, but, you know. Uh, That's what yeah, they're doing for her. They're trying to take care of her. You know, what's right. wrong with her? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And I think that, you know, that, that, um, idleness that the rest cure prescribes, right? Like she talks about it both in the story and also in the adaptation, you know, that, I'm just supposed to sit here. Like I'm not even supposed to write, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, I think that idea of that idleness, that like literally doing nothing um, that the rest cure prescribed is such an interesting um, commentary on women's role at that time too, right? Like what was expected um, of women at this time and what was best for them. Um, and I think that that is really interesting when you think about um, her, like the whole thing with the wallpaper, is it real? Is it her just like downfall because she is being confined and she is being idle and is stuck with her own thoughts. I think one of the most interesting things about this story um, and why maybe it continues to be relevant is that we all, and I think especially like Megan said, in the past year and a half, um, we all like that contained that idleness, that like claustrophobic quality of that is something that we can relate to, right? So there's obviously tons and tons of issues of gender and all of these different things, but I think the piece becomes relatable for anyone because of that confinement and that like sitting with your own thoughts. You know, Maybe being a little scary. <laughs> she talks in her autobiography um, about 
when she was severely depressed and you know and she was she was really in trouble you know all she she would crawl into corners you know all she could do was cry she talked about her tears running into her ears and she said all i could do was lie there and, and i think um she was talking about Esther mitchell specifically yeah you know she said and what was there to do to, but to think about all the things i'm ashamed of and all of my failures and you know i mean that is relatable when you are stuck inside your own head it's like oh i did this oh i failed at that oh i was mean to this person and you know they'll never get over it and you know and that idea i i think you're absolutely right being locked up with your own thoughts without you know another human leavening that somehow i mean that is and that is part of quarantine just always seeing yeah. same people and she wants to talk to john even who is really not very nice to her talk to me <laughs> condescend to me i don't care can you please just talk to me right you know? i'm really desperate even yeah. you <laughs> Yes, even if you're going to treat me like a baby, I, I will talk to you. Yeah. And, you know, it's she can't find any communion with her own baby. You know, that is something that was that's really sad. And, it, you know, she talks about it also in her autobiography. It's like, you know, I like just even even my baby could only bring me sorrow you know and and that was i think devastating to her for sure yeah um as we wrap up because we we could talk all day i'm sure oh, we could <laughs> um, we could for sure um but i just wanted to touch base with both Robin and Megan, any any final thoughts or any final things that you want to touch on about the piece or about the production or anything so our audiences, um, anything that we haven't really talked about that you want to touch on before we go? Oh. <laughs> Robin could talk about this piece all day long, I know. It's a big binder out. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've got like, yeah, I can show you all my... Oh my I, will, I will never throw away all of my notes. Um, but, um, you know, if I were just going to say one thing, it would be, uh, well, there was, I'm going to pick up one more thread uh, before we, before I finish having my say, and that was, you're talking about the wallpaper, and I thought it was really a wonderful decision to put the writing on the wall. Mm -hmm. because you know I mean these are the things that confine her you know these are the words that keep her prisoner you know there's also a, a, you know the sense of the writing on the wall this is yeah. the this is the decision that has been made about her this is the authoritative verdict on her and I thought that that was really masterful I just want to say again how much I love the performance and I thought it was I thought it was evocative of the story and I also thought um you know I gave it a, a real life in its own way and and I was and I was thrilled to be in the theater watching a play too. That was really Something. <laughs> wonderful. So yeah, it's it's been just a pleasure doing this. Well, thank you. And we appreciate it so thank much. So and much. I'll pass that along to Trinity about the wall because uh, she's 18 and she has been um, assistant directing with us. And then, so Janine is her mom um, uh -huh. and they co-directed this together. And that was her idea from day one. She just was like, I want that writing up there um so i will let her know well there's a bright future there <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i think it was it was really really cool and she's she's got amazing ideas they both do so um yeah i'm so glad you enjoyed it and we really appreciate you making the trip all the way from ripon <laughs> to come down and see it. Oh, it was it was it was our pleasure <laughs> great megan any any final thoughts for our audience before we uh say goodbye no, you know, this will be available on demand to watch. And I think the thing is just, like you said, we could talk all day because there's so many things you can get out of it. 
and it and it really can be I mean it's just and it's just a short I don't know if it's a short story or novella or what you would Pretty call it. Short, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a 30 to 40 minute read and and yet so much is there to grab onto. To me it just called out for music. Um and but the, even if you just read the 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 story, I think everybody takes something away from it that it that is a little maybe a little different or or similar to some people, but totally different from other people. And, and that I think is what is, uh, what is so special. And I hope that watching the performance is the same, is the same thing. And I would just encourage everybody to, well, um, obviously, well, you've watched this talk back, but um, watch our talk backs with our other experts and um, explore Lindsay's um, amazing audience guide. There's so much in there. And, and Lindsay, you did a, a beautiful job with that. And so- Thank you got a lot of resources on this show so I'm really happy yes and there's so much criticism and literary stuff out there you could just read about this this piece of literature like for days I had to stop myself as I was researching (laughs) so many so many dissertations and theses out there on this one all right well well, thank you so much um Megan if you want to stop the recording um thank you so much everyone for tuning in we really appreciate you um watching our post-show chat yes thank you bye everyone thank you